welcome aboard. Thank you for watching. Uh, my name is Brett Rademacher. Of course, this is the illustrious, long-bearded Harold Smith, the author of the articles on he that has an ear.com. And each week we do a discussion, at least when I show up, uh, each week we do a discussion, I missed last week, um, on the articles. And sometimes, a lot of times they're series. <clears throat> this is a standalone article, all right, Harl? No other, yeah. And it is one of the most powerful articles you've ever written. Uh, and I've read a lot of your articles. Uh, that's part of what I have to do in order to have these discussions. And this one's Cultivating Virtue. That's the title of it, Cultivating Virtue. And we have a little disclaimer. Uh, make sure you read the article and don't go, don't be lazy and just go by the video. The reason why there's links to word definitions, there's links to verses, there's links to additional articles that build on concepts or precepts or um, uh, components of what's being discussed here in other articles uh, that, you know, extrapolate that thought and then Sometimes there's links to extracurricular material outside Harold's ecosphere, which helps contribute to the overall understanding of what he's writing. So the video is also doesn't cover everything that we have in the article, or Harold has in the article. So make sure you read the article. Okay, cultivating virtue, a big build up. This is really an amazing article. Paul, uh, very powerful. And I can tell because of how many places I have to highlight in order to uh, make sure we touch on something within that area. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I've talked enough. What's up? Well, as I began to um, investigate and, and read about the life example uh, by Yeshua, an example that he uh, encourages us in, in a couple of places to follow. He, he says, I, I am the example for you to follow. And I noticed that several times when it talked about him healing people, that it said virtue went out of it. And another couple of places it says compassion went out of it. And so I just began to ask the father, what is this virtue? Because I always thought it was like power, you know, he had this power that just. Uh, I think, I think. That's how most people think about it. But it, it says virtue went out of, of them. And in, in one place, it said virtue went out of him, and they were all healed. Everybody that was, you know, standing around him. And as I began to look into what this word means, um, and more importantly, how does how does it apply to me? How does where do where do I get virtue from? Uh, how does it? I mean, do I grow it in a garden and go pick it and eat it, or what? What is it? Where did how does where does it come from? And I began to see that in fact we do cultivate virtue in our lives. It's not something that just magically comes upon us. It's something that we have to invest in, um, like planting a garden. You know, when you when you plant a garden, you, you work the soil and get it ready. And, uh, you, you plant it, and you fertilize it, and you water it, and you care for it, and make sure the weeds don't come in and, and take over what you what you know the effort that you put into it. And I saw in the definitions giving the, given these words translated into English as virtue and compassion and different things that in fact, that is what it's calling on us 
uh, to do. The definition translated as the uh, English word virtue comes from the Greek word dynamos. And it's described in Thayer's lexicon as inherent power, the power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature, which a person exerts and puts forth. And it's from the nature of a thing that its power is derived. And I, and I put this example in there that, that as for instance, a wolf, when um, he can't, he can't, when, when, a, when a wolf can be observed uh, uh, in, the, in the capture and devouring of his prey, the wolf does not sit back and contemplate the, the morality of his impulse prior. Kind, kind, kind of like when I eat a steak, you mean? <laughs> prior to engaging the prey, he's, he is simply motivated according to the inherent nature that lies within him. You can't fault a, a wolf for capturing and devouring prey. It's, his, it's in his nature. It's in his inherent nature. In like manner, we, we do what we are. And so we have to, to begin to ask ourselves, you know, how, how do we, how do we uh, cause this virtue in us to to grow the first thing that we need to understand is is that uh when when we are given power you know in in luke 9 and john 21 2021 20, uh, he yeshua uh, told the disciples that he was sending them forth just as the father had sent him forth with the same um, power that he had. But when we, we have to understand what that sending means, it, it does not mean that they were given the power to consume it upon themselves, first of all. And second of all, at one point, Yeshua turned around to those who were following him, and he said, you guys don't get it. The power is for the benefit of unbelief. It's for those who are skeptical of who he was as HaMashiach. Um, the, for those of us who are following Yeshua, to the disciples, he empowered them uh, is there's nowhere in scripture that says anywhere that says that any of the disciples were healed or delivered he empowered them to impart that life of deliverance and healing to others uh, and James says you know we we ask not because we have we have not because we ask not and when we do ask we ask amiss to consume it upon ourselves. It's not what that power is for. And so when we I, can we can we stop there? I, I, I just think I think that's one of the most important points of the article is because if you look at you know modern Christianity, you know, the way it's been perverted for lack of a better word, is that this idea is that we'll be empowered to basically do whatever we feel is important, whatever we want to succeed in. It's like we're being empowered to do this because God is with us, right? God's behind us. Well, what, what Christianity has done is to take in these words 
and sculpt them according sculpt to... Sculpt them. Their, That's a great word. Sculpt them. And, I like that. And, and have, they, they have sculpted them according to the motive and manifestation of the world. The world tells us that what we are supposed to do with our lives is to enhance our lives and to build it up and to gather wealth and to and to become this um, <laughs> extraordinary person you know yes it, it, exactly and, and I think I think the thing about it is is you read this whole article this thing about this empowerment being for others right and it's it's for unbelievers and it's not to be used on yourself when you take that concept and tie it in with how you've laid down a lot of other principles or concepts and clarified what the scripture is actually saying this just like fits dovetail perfect right it's just like boom and you know that's a big part about these articles is you gotta keep reading because as these little pieces get laid in the foundation of your understanding they'll give you more and more clarity as time goes on and and this is a perfect example because you know if you think about it if we were given all this power without any kind of governor or restraint how would we naturally tend to use it like every other human being on the planet right to further our own agenda whatever that is and when you when you look at how this actually works and, and what it means to be a follower, it makes perfect sense. Absolute perfect sense. Well, and when you couple that with the fact that what we are attempting to do here is to become partakers of the divine nature of Yahweh. And the core nature of Yahweh is selflessness, not self denial. But selflessness. Considering now, self denial. Self denial. Let's self denial. What's that? <laughs> in, in a nutshell, it's like I'm making a decision not to do something because that makes me better or good or holy or separated. Versus selflessness would be I'm operating in a spirit all the time as a lifestyle of being made fully available to do what Yahweh leads me to do. The, the selflessness we're talking about is akin to um, what, it, what it says in uh, the epistles that to consider the things of my brother as being of more importance than my own. Kind of, kind of nuke selfishness, real quick. It's what? I said that kind of nukes selfishness real exactly, quick. Exactly, exactly. And so when you, when you, the further I got into Christianity uh, and I began to see some of the motives of people, you know, having, having kind of seen the, this core nature of Yahweh, which was manifest in Yeshua, um, this core nature of selflessness. And I began to look at the motives of some of these um, uh, people that were proclaiming themselves to be, the uh, purveyors of, of God's word and all they were doing was finding scripture that could bring wealth to them. In fact, there was this one um, uh, you Stop there a second. I lived in an area of the country, I won't say where it was uh, but I lived there for a number of years and there was quite the congregation of people that had been led into this area, myself included. And I, I, I think I was led there to get a deep dive education of the wackiness of it all, of how wacky it can get. What not, and to, also, do. Huh? What not to do. Oh yeah. And, um, and it, really gave me an education but as a general rule i saw all these christians that were jockeying for their piece of the pie 
and a lot of it was in ministry or you know the prophetic and it lit ultimately it was all connected to money from everything from charging a lot of money to come in for retreats to uh paying monthly subscriptions to for training like dream interpretation i mean it was and i and i remember and, and because it was such a uh and for whatever reason people were drawn there not just from the united states but all over the world because of some of the things that were going on there i saw an extremely rapid turnover of people who would come in and out for whatever reason and this was constantly a reoccurring theme but it was it was almost like the vast majority had turned into like um performance high performance coaches motivational speakers um you know human potential uh it was it was it was really eye-opening because i saw so much of it so fast with so many different ministries and, and, and people in this area that it really um gave me not not only a kind of a awakening but also to see a huge discrepancy of what these people were doing versus what they were saying versus what scripture was actually talking about and it was and, and we kept pretty much separated from it all I, and, and i was because of my business background people were continually trying to pull me in or connected with you know connect with me you know they, they recognized things on me and i continually had to stay outside the fence but it was an amazing learning experience because what happened was I was really seeing the front lines of how Christianity really operates because I got to know these people. Like I knew them personally, I saw their ministry and that they were influential, they were personal, but I'm telling you, uh, it was all pulling levers, pushing buttons. It was nothing about creating virtue, nothing. And it, and it, you know, it permeates throughout Christianity. Uh, there's a, there's a real reason why the Catholic Church is rich. <laughs> the, the, you know, the hierarchy the, the, of, of the Catholic Church. Oh yeah. It's, it's because they have purposed uh, to gather wealth to themselves. Mm -hmm. And what caused me to start walking down this road was I was looking at this on the one hand, and then looking at the life of Yeshua on the other, you know, here's a fellow who he, he never charged people <laughs> to listen to him speak. Um, the scripture said he had no... Well, way. he wasn't a very good businessman, and he must have uh, really regretted all not taking in all that money because he could have, right? Well, he took in money. I mean, the, the scriptures... Uh, for instance, for instance, when uh, uh, Judas Iscariot came into the group, um, Yeshua said, it said he looked at him, he saw he was a thief, so he gave him the money bag. You know, the, well, in order to have a money bag, that means you got to have money coming in somewhere. People were giving donations to him. But he was very conscientious, Yeshua was very conscientious of what was given to him by the father and anything else was not his well and and if you look what what he did with that money was not to spend it upon himself but when there were people gathered out there in the wilderness 500 people and they had nothing to eat the first thing that that he did well it wasn't that one it was a, a um yeah, it was that one. The first thing he did was he told he told the disciples to go buy bread for all of these people because they were they were famished, and um, uh, they said, "Well, we don't have enough money to to do all of that." And that's when he he fed them, uh, you know, with the fish and the loaves. He he he, was, he knew ahead of time they didn't have the money. He was doing that to see, you know, to show them. That the provision didn't come from money. It didn't come from man. What the, what was the source, right? Amen. I, I, I agree with that. But but the point wow, is. Wow, that's awesome, man. 
<laughs> the point is, is that even what he did have, which wasn't very much, he was, he was, you know. Why, why, why could he be like that, Harold? Why could, why could Yeshua be like that? Because as you just said, the father was his source for everything. And, and, and I, I tell you what, if you're listening to this or watching this, obviously you are, if you're hearing me, but, but, but this is one of the most important things I've learned in my life. And I remember picking it up when I was reading about when uh, the Israelites were in the desert and, and then when they got the promised land, there was different times where Yahweh had them attack different cities. And, you know, sometimes they could take everything, sometimes some things and sometimes nothing. Right. But, but it, he made it very clear what was theirs and what was not theirs. And, and I remember that because I started how it, 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 I started recognizing that even though I could do something or even though I could have something or, or do something, I started realizing is it wasn't mine. It didn't matter if I had the ability. It didn't matter if I had the desire. And just like when uh, those two guys took some, I can't remember exactly what it was, but remember that they took something out of the city and they weren't supposed to, and it cursed Israel and they had to call in a little convention and figure out who it was, right? I don't know if you recall that, but, but the point it really made to me is when, when you take things, even though you're capable, and they're not yours, I think they come with a curse. And, you know, I think they come with a curse in that you could lose them, it could have repercussions, but you have to really learn what is yours and what is not yours. Well, the curse is, is that it, it goes back to being obedient to what the Father is saying to you. And if we're not obedient to what he's saying to us, then we get separated from the nature of spirit and what it does by by getting separated it causes us to become um uh to to become to be in the world and to be subject to the trials to tribulation all of the consequences of of the world all, all the consequences of our own self-effort right yeah i i know that one <laughs> and and so when we when we look at at um how yeshua manifested this this nature in the flesh in this world um the as we said before the that dynamus is the inherent nature of a thing that is exerted as power so when when, so when we look at the power for healing or saving and that it comes from the nature residing in Yeshua, and of course we are his body, um, and so it resides in us, uh, you know, the nature describes the same sort of activity in which in Matthew 14, 14, it describes the, the same sort of activity in which all who were sick uh, were healed. Only here it says he was moved with compassion. So we see compassion and virtue are, are, are very similar. Um, and he was moved with compassion because his inherent nature was compassionate. Um, and the... So we have to we have to ask, well, where did that compassion for, come from? The Greek word rendered as the English compassion in that verse. I can't pronounce it, but it means uh, to be moved as to one's bowels. Hence, to be moved with compassion or have compassion. Um, the the bowels, in other words, the heart, the lungs, the liver were considered to be the seat of mercy and love. And remember that... that what, what, what does that mean exactly, the seat of mercy and love? You're talking these organs are the well, seat of mercy and love. What does that mean? If you remember in a previous article, we discussed the glory and that 
the the Hebrew word for glory is kavod, but a offshoot of kavod is kavod, and uh, where kavod means something that is weighty or very honorable. Um, and as we've also discussed previously in the Hebrew language, uh, you oftentimes a word will be used to describe two different things. And in this case, the, the, the word kavod is also found to be uh, translated as the English liver. And the liver is the heaviest organ in the body. So when the glory of Yahweh comes and resides in us, it settles in our liver. Okay, this is this is okay. This is such a fascinating concept. You know, I, I've read this a number of times, but this idea that by residing in His glory and His Spirit resting in our liver cleanses our blood. That's the function of the liver. It this is so. So there is literally a physical repercussion of operating in this place. repercussion i would say a um benefit a benefit. A, a consequence benefit, consequence consequence a result of a result a, of right when we receive yahovah by keeping his words um and by embracing yeshua as the hamashiach or the messiah of israel and, and manifesting that life that he exampled for us, that spirit. So, so the first time I read that, the first time I read that, I was like, you know, if you look at the state of the health of the world, you know, United States, very unhealthy, overweight, uh, other countries, a lot of disease and sickness, third world countries. You look at this concept that man was created to be in this relationship with his creator and and you know the human race as a whole has just moved completely out of any kind of connectedness of how they were designed to operate and you you see this rampant uh, issue with poor health and disease and sickness and you know the pandemic that's going around the world there's literally a physical protection that comes from operating in this place, isn't there? Um, the short answer to that question is yes. But? But there is more to it than that. Yes, there it's is. Not a, it's not a, a blanket guarantee or anything. It It is, it all... Um, is conditional on our moment by moment keeping his words and um, manifesting those words as Yeshua did. Now, and wait, wait, wait. The moment by moment is such a powerful phrase because yes. because I I think that's one of the key disciplines we all have to go through is realize it's not like stop and go one-offs you know i got i'm covered you know i had this great interaction or experience and then off and running right it's a it's a it's a interactive dynamic dynamic real-time deal it's it's a dynamous <laughs> it's 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 real time it it's is. real time but but i also want to caution whoever's listening to this to remember that the core nature of this spirit that comes and settles in our liver is selflessness we're not asking for that so that we will all be made healthy and we will all be healed because remember the disciples you know they they were not healed or delivered what they were given the power and as we reside inherently in his nature, we will find that power um, manifesting itself in us. And will there be side benefits to that in our flesh? 
has been with me. But if we go looking for it, you see, we move out of the- We're, we're, we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're right. focusing we move, on the, we the benefit. The realm, we move out of the realm of selflessness into the realm of selfishness. So, and, so it, it's, it's, you have to be prepared because, because I, I, I know from thinking about this long and hard, you have to be prepared to release everything you hold dear. Amen. This walk is going to cost you everything. Now, everything is different for everybody, right? It's, it, it's, it's, it's not like we don't really know what everything is for a particular person because it's all individualized, but it, it is an emptying out of what you hold dear and you have to realize your life is not your own and this walk is not determined by you. Well, to be succinct, it will cost you your life. Yeah, because, because your life is not your own, right? And, and then you are not created for your own self, right? You weren't like, I'm making you, you know, you know, like there's even Christians that imply or even say directly that our purpose in life is to um, get these concepts down that allow us to manifest our own reality as if we were a God, right? Literally. I mean, literally, this is being taught in, you know, some, you know, like the word of faith movement, name it, claim it kind of thing. It's crazy because it's complete opposite. Now, a lot of people intuitively know that that's bogus, but they just don't quite get why, right? Well, in the, in the, in, in the, in the manner in which you just portrayed it, it is bogus. But that is, that is, a, that is something that is, that is true. The truth is... Um, we do become Yahweh. We do become Yeshua. But it's completely different. But it's completely different than how they're doing it, right? Well, they're like they're, not, you don't become your own God. It's that He abides in you, and you become Him. Yeah, it, it's it's which is how you were created to be. And right. so what they've done is they've hijacked the concept and twisted it. For your own self-enrichment whatever that means and they're appealing to your natural nature right your natural nature of acquiring stuff or power or wealth or whatever it is so it's it's so subtle but it's huge it, it is and uh it is it is it's the way of the world and what we are called to do to be is in the world but not of it. Yeah. Let, let, there's a, a, a line here that you go on, you extrapolate more, but I, I find it completely fascinating. It's kind of the next part of your article. Yeshua took her sin upon himself that she might be healed. Or took her sin upon himself. And then you explain what's going on there. This is really powerful. As the essence of Yahweh's nature comes to rest and settle in a disciple through the embrace of Yahweh's words, the liver is revitalized. The main function of the liver is to cleanse the blood of impurities and the life of the flesh is in the blood. The essence of the source of life becomes a part of our physical being to cleanse and purify our blood. Thus, our nature is changed into his. Now, this is, this is, this is power right here. You said, the pure, the consistency of the blood, the pure, the consistency of the blood becomes the life within us. The frequency of resonance is raised and the more brilliant the light within us radiates, the more pulsating a force it exerts in the physical realm. This is what Yeshua meant by bringing the kingdom of Yahweh into his earthly realm. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I highly doubt anyone has heard it, or very few people have heard it, that, that verse. 
explained in that dynamic. That is um, eye open. Um, there is a whole article uh, that the, po the power in his name. The power in his name. Okay, but here's 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 where it goes back to you know Yeshua healing. It says here it says. It was from the virtue residing in the nature of Yeshua's blood, so pure that he was able to absorb the sin of those he healed as light consumes darkness. That right there is like, you could put that in quotes, put it on a poster, nice picture, <laughs> little meme. Go, let talk about that for a bit, because uh, that's like, that's like one of those concepts when you start thinking about it, you kind of go, whoa. When I first began to see this dynamic of light and darkness, that darkness has never, nor will it ever overcome the light. Light overcomes darkness. Um, and the power in that, I hadn't, I hadn't reached, I hadn't fully, comprehended it all but i saw that this was the dynamic that yeshua was using that his his light he he was able to take on that sin and and when you think about it uh you know christianity purports that he died for the sin of the world he took on the sin of the world right again that's a truism the truth is he literally did that. <laughs> and when he, when he was, um, uh, came into an arena where there was sin, he took it. He took that sin of that woman. And uh, so I thought, well, let's just give this a, you know, try to see, see how this works. <laughs> so I had, uh, I had just gotten to, to Israel. And I was I was I was a volunteer in this in this um, uh, uh, Israeli um, ministry over there, and um, I went into the office and there was a woman there who had um, just a week or so before had gotten into a car wreck and it really messed up her back. Right, she was just in constant pain, and I said, okay, well. Let's heal that thing. I reached <laughs> and, and I said, Father, I just, I take this pain. Next morning, I could not get out of bed. Really? <laughs> My back was killing me. I mean, for three or four days, I just, I was in agony. And uh, finally, I got over that. And then there was another woman that came into the office who worked there. And she had, she had a, a, the flu and, but she needed the money to come work. And uh, so I said, okay, you know, father, I, I just take this. I got sicker than the dog. Wow. <laughs> and I saw that this wasn't, this wasn't the outcome that I saw Yeshua doing. Yeshua never got, he didn't get sick when he took those things on. And I couldn't figure out what was going on until the father showed me that my light was not as brilliant as Yeshua's. I had to cultivate that brilliance by embracing the nature of spirit to the extent that it became that pure, that my, okay. blood, that my blood was pure enough to manifest light in that, in that regard. Um, since then, uh, you know, that was some years ago, uh, I have seen how that works now, that I can, you know, reach out and say, be healed. I'm taking that sin, but it's becoming um, dissipated by the light. The darkness that, that's coming in is being dissipated by the, by the light. Uh -huh. now, there there is a point where you can create enough darkness that you that you extinguish light but that darkness that we're talking about now is not um taking on somebody else it's it's by not adhering to the words of the father and so 
instead of instead of creating light, creating virtue, we are actually growing and creating darkness so that that darkness within us can eventually overwhelm that light. I had gotten to that point at one time in my life. Um, and the father gave me, he showed me. Uh, I can remember where I was, where I was standing, what I was doing. <clears throat> and he showed me that my light, and this was, this was way before I went to Israel. He showed me that my light had become just a very small, you know, like you see a, a candle just before it's, you know, coming to the end of itself. It's just a very small uh, flicker of a light. Good wind can blow it out. And so that, that got me turned around. And, right. Uh, so as I, as I began to, to walk in this, the more I walked in the nature of his spirit, the, the more brilliant my life has become. Um, and I, I have seen it exercised in my life. It's not something that, that I, you know, go out and say, well, I'm going to exercise it. It's, it is, it is something that by listening to the Father, um, I see it manifested towards other people, particularly brethren within, within his family. Right. Does that give you a... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Idea? So uh, let's, let's talk about... Um... Well, here is something really fascinating you said in here. What caused Yeshua's death on the cross was that he bled out from his wounds. And as the full weight of the generational sins from Adam that had tentacled themselves into all of his family's predecessors came upon him, without that blood, was unable to bear them up. Yeshua's disciples are sent in the same manner as he was to take upon themselves the sins of those they encounter that healing might occur with the recipient of that healing following Yeshua as a result. Now that doesn't mean that we walk into a nursing home and empty it out. It doesn't because I was going to try that right after our meeting. No, if you, no. if you remember when Yeshua went to the healing pool and you know, crowds of people that had been waiting there all year long because once a year the, an angel would come and touch, disturb the water and the first one in would get healed. And there was this guy that was, he was so crippled that he could never get to the pool in time, you know, to do that. And out of all of those people, he healed one. Because wow. Listening to the voice of the father and the father said, this guy's ready. And that's where we have to be with this. We have to constantly be hearing the voice of the Father so that when he says, reach out and touch this one, we can. And we're doing it not only in the, in the power that's resident within us, but we're allowing his power to manifest itself through us. So it's, a, it's, it's not a... It's not a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not something that we use indiscriminately. It's, it's, it's something that. Well, yeah. And, and I think, I think the thing that people have to realize, Christians especially, is you see all these things going on. Now, whether they're actually happening or whether, you know, there's spiritual manipulation, emotional, mental manipulation of people, whatever it is, but because of the face of Christianity and how they see Christianity is being done, a lot of it is presented of your own self volition, right? It's what you are trying to manifest. And it's actually the opposite. It's what's being manifested in and out of you. Yeah. I, when I came, uh, first came in, you've heard me, talk about this before when I first came into this this walk with Yahweh I had come come out of the world of sorcery and I saw that in Did you have a hat <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> I'm just curious no 
No, I um, um, I saw though how things in in Yahweh's spirit operated very similar to the stuff in 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 sorcery, the mechanics of it, if you will. And I asked the father about that, I, you know, because I was thinking, well, this is all something entirely different. And I, I saw a similarity here. And the father showed me that the, the motivation of sorcery is the imposition of self, our self desires upon others or circumstances to manipulate them according to what we want to see happen. Whereas the nature of his spirit is the impartation of life, the life example uh, by Yeshua into, into others. And it has nothing to do with with my selfish inclinations. A lot of people in Christianity are praying for somebody to be healed because they don't want to see them suffer, but they haven't heard the voice of, of the father. And consequently what they are doing is operating in that realm of source of sorcery and be aware there is a very real power in that realm of sorcery. We see that example in the sorcerers of, of Pharaoh's uh, court when Moses was there. Uh, they replicated <laughs> many of the things that Moses, is, Moses did, you know, his bag of tricks, and, and they did the same thing. It was only on the last one where Moses, um, he threw down his rod and it became a snake. They threw down their rods. It also became a snake. They also became a snake. The difference was it was that Moses' snake ate theirs. <laughs> but when you when you see that realm of sorcery is very real. It was what it was what drew me into it because I was tantalized by this power that I saw. I, 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 absolutely, I've heard that time and time again. People get into the occult, witchcraft, that kind of stuff, spiritism. You know, a lot of different names for it. Because they're, they're looking for power in their life. Exactly. In fact, uh, when, when Yahweh appeared to me on this dirt road out in Northern California by myself, uh, he said to me, Harold, if you want to see power, follow me and I'll show you what power is all about. And I mean every fiber in my being knew that this was truth speaking to me. But it wasn't the kind of power you thought of when you thought of power, right? That's correct. He completely transformed my understanding of power in that it, it, is, it, is, the, uh, it is the embrace of his nature within me, resident in my liver, cleansing my blood, causing me to become a part of Yeshua's body, that I can walk and manifest his nature in this earthly realm just as he did. You know, it is, it is, and that's what he prayed. In, in John 17, he, he prayed first for the disciples that, that father that they become ichad or which is hebrew for one but it also means in unity with you just as in in like manner in 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 similar fashion that i am one with you that they become ichad in you and then he goes on down in in verses 20 and 21 and he says and not only do i pray for these 12 but i pray for anyone who would who would uh, uh, hear the witness of their word and would also come to you that they become God as we are, just as in like fashion, in similar manner. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't you can't ignore those words. I mean, he he was very explicit in what he was praying there. 
Absolutely. And the disciples were very explicit in how they received those words, and then they went on and manifest his life in, in this earthly world. Now, now, we're starting to wind down, but you said something here that I think is a real uh, belief buster, <laughs> as you uh, have a uh, propensity for doing. Uh, so, I'm going to throw this out here. From where, then, did Yeshua initially obtain his nature? Many believe it is because he pre-existed with the Father from creation. So why don't you run with that one for a bit? <clears throat> this idea of predestination that we all, you know, existed before we were we were born comes directly out of Dante's Inferno in that there is this well of souls that abides and that at the proper time we're picked out and thrown into the earthly realm. I want to remind everybody that Dante's book, uh, The Inferno, wasn't written until the what, 12th, 13th, 14th century. And it's a work of fiction. <laughs> it's like picking up uh, a Harry Potter book and thinking that this is the truth. It's a work of fiction. And to, to the problem that we have in, in our society in America today is that all we are handed for entertainment, for uh, reference material, it's, it's fiction. Even our history has been rewritten. I remember reading a, a quote that says, history is written by the victor. Exactly. And after a period of time, um, even, even, you know, it, it can be rewritten again to satisfy in the United States, it's being rewritten right now as we have, you know, all this social unrest and monuments being destroyed, good or bad. That's, that's not the point. But we're seeing things erased so that something else can replace it. But you see, that is not, that is, that is not being true to history. Just because, just because we had and still have this uh, gigantic um, error uh, in our history, to not see it for what it is, to not be taught about it, causes us then to have a skewered Skewed view. I, I, absolutely. If you look at Germany when they were burning books, they were literally trying to erase the identity of the nation in order to create a new identity, right? And 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 one of the things you mentioned earlier, you know, that you were put in a place that was completely screwy, and the father was putting you there so that you could learn from that screwing us so that you wouldn't embrace it yourself oh yeah it was you know i was never attracted to it and what it, what i think it was really about was getting a really high level of discernment of, of and just being exposed to how rampant it was it was it was really it was just a really fast educate i mean it was fast deep intense over about a six-year period and um, it was, but if, but if that if that situation hadn't been there, you wouldn't have been able to learn from it. No, not at all. You're and right. It's, and, it's the same with erasing all of this history, thinking that that's going to correct something. And what it's what it does is just it obscures the history so that that nature will re, will be repeated at some point down the road. And um, we just have to be very careful with 
what we use to construct um, the narrative of um, our life. Uh, we're, we're winding down. I want to I want to read a couple things towards the end of the article. I'm actually skipping a page or so in there, but um, I want to read a couple of things. Whenever I highlight it in teal, it's like a little bit more on the. Uh, as noted, the function of the liver in the body is to keep the body free of impurities by a continual cleansing of the blood, a continual washing the water of Yahweh's words. Only those who do the will of the Father, Father shall enter the kingdom. The will of the Father is expressed in his words, all of his words. To believe in, to abide in his name, is to receive the breath of life and keep his words. In doing so, we are embracing the very nature of Yahweh, um, which gives us the power to become sons of the Most High. The Greek word power in this verse is ekousia. 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 And means power of choice. To become a son is not an automatic blessing. We must exercise the power given us if his words are to become flesh within us, just as those words became flesh in the life of his son. In order for the blood of the sons to remain pure requires a choice to keep his words. If you would enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19, 17. Anything you want to say about that before we wind it up? Well, what words are we talking about? Well, that's what you got to tell us right before we finish up. You can use this as a teaser to keep people coming back. <laughs> Okay, it's really a teaser to read the whole article, right? Because we can never cover it all, especially, you know, if you've been here before and watched these discussions, there's, you know, um, we're the frosting, the cakes, the article. It's the 10 words of the Father. Sometimes they've been popularly reclassified as commandments. But if you read in Exodus 20, um, verses 1 through 17 in the very first verse it just says these are the words of yahweh yeah my commandments they are instructions on how to remain in the nature of light in yeah. the nature of and, and so i'm gonna i'm gonna finish up with reading and you you can give a closing thought but i'm gonna finish up with the three paragraphs towards the end of the article when Yeshua said to be perfect, even as your father is perfect in Matthew 5, 48, he was not giving us something to do that was beyond our reach, nor was he telling us anything new. He was not giving us a new command. He was quoting 1 Kings 8, 61 from the Tanakh, the original book, where the Hebrew word shalom is translated as perfect. It means complete, of keeping covenant relationship, peaceful, whole, full, at rest, and out of which comes the word Shalom. To be perfect then does not mean to be flawless, but made complete in keeping his covenant, which the psalmist tell us, psalmist tells us is perfect. And by the keeping of it, our soul is converted, returned, or brought back to its original state, restored to life and revitalized. In the Torah, this exercise, the exercise is called being holy because Yahweh is holy. To be holy is to remain set apart from the world influences uh he has separated us from by his spirit by resting in obedience to his words Whew. that's a mouthful isn't it yeah it is anything you want to say it's your words <laughs> you wrote them well i didn't read them i'm just reporting on, on yeah there you go they right me. i they uh, to be holy there are so many people in the world that have been convinced that is an impossibility when in fact from cover to cover the this book we call the bible tells us to be holy it doesn't take some um extra spiritual um incarnation and or an other to make in order to make that happen it just simply means to keep his words if we keep his words 
we will be holy. Now, people ask me, well, you, you, that means you don't sin. And I tell them, you're correct. I don't sin. Have I sinned in the past? Yes, I have. But we're told in 1 John that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive that sin, to cleanse us, to wash it away, thrown into the sea, never to be remembered anymore, and placed back in right standing with him. And as long as I keep his words today, I'm not sinning. I am holy. Will I sin tomorrow? I don't know. It hasn't got here yet. But Yeshua said, don't consider the things of tomorrow. Sufficient enough is the evil we are uh, involved in today. You know, put your focus on today and keeping yourself holy today. And if we, if we keep his words today, we don't sin. Hence, today, I am not a sinner. Amen. Awesome, Marco. Thank you, Harold.